Uh, welcome. Welcome to the New America Foundation. We are a, a DC think tank, a policy institute. Uh, for those of us that are joining us online, we work on a variety of different issues, everything from foreign policy to health care reform. And my name is Sasha Meinrath, and I direct the Open Technology Initiative, which is sort of the tech and telecom arm of the Foundation's work. And for the past 10 years or so, I've been more or less climbing around on roofs and building a lot of community wireless networks, both here in the States and overseas, and building sort of systems that are using kind of innovative, at the time, incredibly innovative business models and technologies. And I would say that over time, over the past five or 10 years, we found that these innovations have proven to be remarkably successful and sustainable and provided and delivered affordable even free broadband uh, to a number of underserved communities across the United States and around the globe. And while I may not be climbing around on roofs anymore, uh, at least not that I would report here in DC, um, I will also say that as a policy institute, us think tankers are still very much involved in these battles. And for our part, we're continuing to support community and municipal broadband across the United States. And over the next year, the Open Technology Initiative is really going to be focusing on four key intervention areas. Uh, number one is USF, Universal Service Fund Reform, which has the potential to support broadband deployment and interventions and innovations all across the country, and which is pending before the FCC right now. Likewise, E-rate, which is sort of a, a subsidy to allow organizations to get free or, I should say, subsidized broadband connectivity. Uh, E-rate reform is going to be really important to establish and expand upon the number of entities, the kinds of entities uh, that are eligible for buying affordable broadband. Uh, we've also been working on a, something we, we call the Building the 21st Century Broadband Superhighway, which with my colleague Ben Lennett, we have worked with a number of congressional offices. And this is a notion of when we rip up roads, we should be laying down big broadband, open access fiber accessible to any organization or entity or municipality that wants to utilize these resources. And finally, sort of a BTOP 2.0. Uh, there is a desperate need in this country for digital literacy training, adoption programs, and et cetera to help bridge the digital divide. And without that, it doesn't matter how extensive or inexpensive our broadband is. It needs to be salient to individuals. It needs to be dem demonstrable what the benefits of these resources are. And so our hope is that BTOP won't be a one-off program, but will be followed up with sound policy to kind of leverage these resources that are out there. But all of this work, all of this work that we're doing, would be simply impossible uh, without kind of the vision exemplified from the, by the people that we have here today. And in many ways, I feel like the experts that are gathered here are really setting the trends for w what are the battles that we will be supporting from our perch here in DC. And I'm, I'm deeply honored, in fact, to have a number of pioneers here, uh, both from both coasts, from the East Coast and from the West Coast. And their vision has really supported these innovations. And, and their work has helped make sort of universal, affordable broadband access a reality in a number of different communities all across the United States. So to get us started, I'm going to turn things over to Craig Settles. And I've known Craig for years. I think we first met maybe 2004 or 2005. And you were already a veteran of, of these battles uh, at that point in time. And he's been both a, a tireless advocate as well as sort of a savant-like business planner for communities all across the country. Uh, and there are few people anywhere with the knowledge and expertise uh, that Craig brings to the table. And he'll be just discussing sort of a, a compendium of his wisdom, uh, the latest in, I guess, what is now a series of books, uh, which is Fighting the Next Good Fight, uh, Bringing True Broadband to Your Community, which is a fantastic read. It's accessible, and it's really concrete. It's not one of these pie-in-the-sky notions of like, hey, you should really think about doing something nice. It really gets down to brass tacks, and I really appreciate that you've put the time and energy to concretize that for all of us. And his presentation will be followed by a moderated discussion. I'll leave it to Ben Lennett to introduce the panelists when it is their time, uh, amongst sort of a number of luminaries that we've identified. Uh, and we'll finish off with Q&A from the audience itself, from all of you and from those that are online. 
uh, where you will get to ask your questions and have them answered by this panel of experts. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Craig Settles to the stage. Good afternoon. After an intro like that, I had to check and check my pulse because I was like, whoa, is this the last sermon on my... Um, I have been at this for a while. Um, in, uh, if, if internet years were like dog years, I'd be really a veteran. Um, I, I've been at the, the municipal broadband area for five or six years and um, accidentally uh, I would have to say, I was writing a book on something related to mobile technology, and Philadelphia was just stirring the pot with their municipal wireless network, and um, it sounded like such a great fight, and I'm from Philadelphia, and it's nice to see Philadelphia doing something that was really positive and ahead of the curve, and so I said, well, let me write a book about this, and, um, <clears throat> and that was a good learning experience. Everyone should do this at least once. Um, most of you will never do it again, I guarantee. Uh, a few of us crazies will stick with it because it's a good learning experience. It's a good way to figure out, you know, sort of the ins and outs and the whys and wherefores and so forth. And like um, Sasha said, it's not uh, a lot of pie in the sky. It's not really what I do. And um, I uh, was on a trip once not too long ago, and I went to Canada. Make sure this thing works. Hello? Hmm. There we go. Lovely technology, the bane of my existence on some days. But anyway, I show up in Canada, and I'm at Customs, and I'm getting ready to go through. And I get this old dude hanging out there at the Customs gate. And he goes, well, what are you doing here? which is kind of odd question for a customs agent, I thought. And being a proverbial, smart, wise, cracking individual, I said, well, I was very bad in a prior life, and so here I am. And uh, I ended up in some place in the back of the airport in some security pen for an hour and a half after that. And I had time to ponder, well, what am I here for um, besides getting into trouble? And what I really feel like yeah, why I write these books is I'm a facilitator, right? The idea is to facilitate people who want to have good, effective broadband in their communities. And I don't feel like I am the person to give someone all the answers because I don't have all the answers. There's too many communities. There's too many unique situations. There's too many things that you have to allow for. But what you really need in this process is a way to facilitate how do I get from A to B on down the line. And so the, the book, this book anyway, that we'll talk about is going to address that. And it'll address it in the context of local strategy, and national strategy because we have a lot of folks here in Washington that are now focused on broadband, whether wrongly, rightly, however you want to view that, but it has become a national discussion at this point, followed by action and policy and money. Um, at the same time, broadband is a local issue, and I will go into more detail about this later, and we can't lose sight of the fact that it is ultimately local. You know, regardless to what happens here in D.C., um, there are people in various communities, large and small and indifferent, rich and poor and everything in between, and they have to live with these policies. They also have to live with the decisions they as a community make and how they plan and how they move this project forward. And so today we're going to try to put that into a context of, uh, you know, what are the, some of the key things that we need to do if I'm on the D.C. side, if I'm on the local uh, side, if I own the issue, the broadband issue. So yes, I am an uh, independent analyst. Uh, I do write a lot about uh, issues that are, to me, important in this broadband discussion. Uh, I am an advocate. Uh, I make no bones about the fact that I believe in broadband and its value. And I believe in the community's role in broadband. So I'm very, very much into that. Um, as I said, I'm a facilitator, helping 
business organizations, government organizations, everyone who's involved in that process come to a point where they have the broadband that best meets their needs. Um, and then <clears throat> someone accused me of having a genetic defect, and so as a result of this, I write books and I write reports, and it's fun and it's interesting. Um, like I said, everyone should try it at least once or twice. Uh, the fighting the good fight for municipal wireless is really my uh, full-on entry into this you know, facilitating of broadband when it was primarily a discussion about wireless. And now five years later, we're really talking about a variety of technologies. And later I'll make the point that we shouldn't really focus on just wireless or just fiber. It is a multitude of technologies, the same as it is a multitude of, of paths and strategies to getting to where you want to get to. So objectives for the day. I'm going to pull out just a handful of some of the, uh, the key lessons of the book. Um, I want to show the intersect, as I said, between uh, national uh, strategy and local strategy. And also, uh, we'll be hearing via the panel from people in the field who are actually doing things, making stuff happen. And this is a cool thing. All right. One of the um, elements of broadband st strategy development that I am truly fanatical about is the needs assessment and understanding the needs of the end user. And as we as a community, if you're a community planner, or we as a policy maker, I think we have to understand this basic concept that it is about meeting needs that we are doing this. And we should also be clear that this is not a discussion about access, right? And now this may sound like sacrilege because we're talking about broadband adoption and we're talking about people who don't have access, but really and truly, it's not the access. If all we wanted to worry about was access, we slap some wires together and we throw them into some area, some community somewhere, and say, here, have a nice day, and we don't think about it anymore. What the issue is, what the needs are, are better education, better health care in places where people can't easily get to a doctor. We're talking about economic development in an economically trying time. It is the use of the internet is really what this is all about. And what we really want to look at in the needs assessment process is what is it that people want to do? Because these issues of, you know, should we set the speed, uh, uh, you know, our objective speed at you know, 5 KBS, should it be 5 megs, 100 megs, what have you, that's just about getting online. What is it that people are going to want to do? Because when you address the issue of what it is they want to do, these other things about technology and speeds and feeds and, and so forth will become apparent because you'll realize that if our goal is to um, bring telemedicine to a rural community, then if I establish a benchmark of 756K as broadband, as a true description, or I, I set this policy related to is broadband advertised in that community, right? This is, this is kind of a useless exercise because the need begs for a certain type of technology and the need begs for a certain type of speed. And it begs for certain types of support to go along with the network, the physical network infrastructure that you put into place. So that you don't just build something and you turn it over to a community and you don't provide all of the other auxiliary stuff that will actually move them to meeting their need of, uh, of telemedicine, of bringing health care up a few notches to people who really need improved health care. Right? So we got to understand that. The other thing we need to understand is that every community is unique. They have some core similarities, but Wichita, Kansas, and Philadelphia, and uh, Sheboygan have very distinct and unique needs. Now, Google, love them, hate them, believe them or not, whichever you choose, they understood unique. 
because they didn't walk in with anything other than this concept. Okay, if you had a gigabit of speed, what would you do? Not what do we think you should do, what us and five partners or co-collaborators, uh, you know, what, what do the telecom companies think? It's what do you, each individual community, think it is that you need or want to do with broadband. So our approach from a policy making perspective, from a DC perspective, is not this sort of top down, well you need this and you need that, and you bring in some people who aren't necessarily from the communities, they don't live and work in the trenches, they don't suffer from the problems that you're trying to address. You go to those people that have the unique needs and you understand what it is that they want and they need and you should try to craft policy that facilitates them without trying to give them the actual full-on solution. Because trying to do that with so many unique communities is setting yourself up for a dismal performance, if not out and out failure. Uh, one of the things I write about in the book is what I call the uh, creation orientation versus problem solving. And I won't take full credit or any credit for the term creation orientation because it was used by the person who ran the focus groups in Philadelphia. Creation orientation, well, let me just start with what is problem solving? I have this problem. Okay, here's a fix, go home, have a nice day. Right? You end the discussion. Creation orientation, you wake up and you do a Google and say, if you had this, what would you do with it? And maybe you give them a sort of an outline of some of the possibilities to kind of get the ball rolling, get the little creative juices going. But when they think about what can I do, right? In Philadelphia, when they were doing all of their needs assessment and their focus groups and their town hall, you know, the medical uh, communities came in and they envisioned a certain type of health care. They envisioned certain types of emergency responses if they had, uh, at that point, municipal wireless. And the education uh, folks came in with their view, you know, what could we create, right? You take the negative, I've got this problem and I'm mad and I'm upset and I just want you to fix it, and you start playing to people's intellect and their creativity, and then all of a sudden, good things happen, great things happen. So you want to look at this from a creation, what do you want to make? What can you make? And then your policy and your tactics are determined by what comes out of that process. And you can do this in a community of 10,000, you can do it in a city of 15 million and beyond. It's the same core exercise. What is it that you want to do? What is it can you do? You can worry later about trimming things down because you don't have quite enough money, quite enough the right resources, but we need to start from a point up here of greater, you know, creating solutions to major problems that we face rather than having this moaning and whining session that someone puts a Band-Aid on just so you'll shut up and get out of their face. By the way, I'm very blunt in, in some of my comments, so if I'm not dancing and using the proper DC euphemisms and, and how we talk about things in kind terms, life's that way, you know. I apologize, but I don't. All right. Now, here's the point where some, some people uh, get a little uncomfortable when I say what you want to identify is not only, you know, just who needs the application, who needs the technology. I sat down uh, earlier today uh, with someone from a, uh, one of the associations for uh, county officials and his whole thing is, you know, we want, you know, our mission is, is broadband for people who can't afford it, which is great and it's good and it's the right thing to do and it is noble. However, somebody has to pay someone else to put that equipment in place. Someone has to pay the people to run it and to operate it and to fix it and to deal with the 101,000 phone calls that you get in the dead of night. And those people expect paychecks when they get done because they got mortgages and kids and all the rest of it. This internet thing, it's a business. It needs to run like a business because if it does not run like a business and it does not earn money like a business from somewhere in some way, all the public good that people want to do is going to get lost in the process. 
it's a basic cold reality of life and so in our planning you know put on your noble cape and go forth to fight great battles but someone better be along on this ride that's a total accounting geek who will try to help you figure out how to make this a viable business it's just again it's just the way it is the public good justifies the network but it is revenue that sustains the network and so when you look at this you know who's going to pay what services are we going to create not just for underserved communities but who's willing to pay for services if I go back to the Philadelphia example which is the core of a lot of what you'll read in this book right there are folks who talk about you know well how can the hospitals change how they deliver health care services and they're willing to pay for that how can businesses transform the way they do business and go from being a local Philly company to an international company right and they find that answer they find that solution they're willing to pay for it and you find this institution and this group and that organization that are all willing to pay for the service you now have a financially sustainable network and then you can go out and do good works and get favorable you know rating when you go up to see St. Peter you need to cast the net fairly wide right one of the things you don't want to get into is tunnel vision alright we're gonna build this network and we're gonna just worry about the businesses and we're gonna you know do this for economic development great fine but you've got to look at who are the other constituents who are the constituents maybe down the road two or three years because it's not just about here and now because by the time you build for here and now here and now is yesterday and it's old news so you've got to have a future focus as well as a here and now focus need defines technology got a whole chapter on that one all right so many times so many communities so many policymakers go charging forth into this whole realm of broadband giddy up giddy up giddy up with a vision of technology that is just it's got to be this or nothing if you don't have fiber that's not real broadband if you don't have wireless you're not going to be able to provide to, you know broadband in in rural communities right vision is too narrow it's too myopic we have to look at the need and have the need to find the technology right we have to challenge our assumptions Right, remember the also the thing the network has to financially sustain itself right I'm on a project now it's all about um, you know what's their best broadband option the conventional wisdom there is that fiber is it it's the way to go so forth and so on yes that is true but sometimes for some constituents having 10 megs today and then a technology path to a hundred megs in a year is a financially more viable way to drive the process than to uh, than, than to create all of these challenges trying to build the entire enchilada today but the only way that you can have this rational thought is to is to come at it from the standpoint of let's see what people need let's see what they need now let's see what they need in three years and in five years and that's got to be part of that whole needs assessment picture and then the technology plan that, that evolves after that right your applications suit the need the services suit the need um, consider the environment in which the technology is going to be used this is a critical part of the technology planning process and I learned this particular lesson um, writing and doing work in, for mobile technology you know how I, I got a thousand mobile workers and um, they're in the field and we're thinking about buying them a bunch of brand whatever mobile devices okay why are you gonna get them brand B devices well you know I was on this plane with this guy and he was talking about they have these devices and they work really well for them okay what do they do well they're in the medical profession okay fine what do your workers do well we're you know in construction aha people using mobile devices in medical environments have a very different way of working than people who are in construction the environment in which your end user works 
has almost as much to do with your technology choices, or should, as you know, what's it going to cost and what need are you addressing, right? I think people figured out somewhere in the middle of the, the, the whole stimulus exercise uh, last year when folks started talking about, well, we're gonna, we got to get money to you know, the, the New England states before winter because if you're in New England, no one's going to be wanting to be out there in, in October trying to like plow through concrete, you know, dirt in the dead of winter. Nor are they going to want to be up on poles hanging access points for wireless technology in Minnesota in January. So not only does it become a building issue, but if you think one step further, how people use that network is going to be affected by weather, by terrain, whether they're trees, and a whole slew of other factors that we haven't even thought about yet. So the needs assessment has got to include where and how do people work. The technology you select has to address where and how it is that people work. Creating partnerships. This is key crucial, crucially key. Did I say this was important? All right. The partnerships that a community creates is crucial to the success of the project. At a national level, the partnerships that you create in trying to execute policy at that level is also crucial. You pick the wrong partner, life isn't going to be pretty. First rule about partnerships, right? It has to be a partnership more than in name. You know, we, there, the, the stimulus thing was great for um, advocating the private-public partnership. Public-private partnerships were formed within days of the stimulus rules hitting. As everyone figured out, oh, I need to find, I need to find a government, I need to find a government group or a nonprofit group because I need to partner with them so I can get this money. Right? I sort of dread to think about how that partnership is going to actually execute once they get money. Consider it like a shotgun wedding. Right? Consider it Britney Spears' first wedding. All right? How much hope did that sucker have when she jumped into this thing in Vegas on a whim? Right? I hope she's not watching this webcast because I'll probably be in all kinds of trouble. But life is what it is. Right? Business is no different. Right? There's an issue of uh, you know, planned thought behind how this is going to work. Right? I talk about you know, there's participation in the partnership and there's commitment. Let's be clear on what the difference between those two is. Right? For those of us <coughs> carnivores who start our day with, say, bacon and eggs for breakfast, um, we won't ask for a show of hands here because I know it's a sensitive issue for some folks. Right? But if you look at the breakfast, right, the chicken, yeah, the chicken participated in breakfast. Gave you a couple eggs, clucked on her merry little way. The pig, unfortunately, that critter was committed to your breakfast. All right? Understand participation and commitment. We won't go there with that sound effect. Thank you. You need people in the partnership that are committed. The, the, the private sector company has to understand and be willing to deal with the needs of the, of the public sector partner or the nonprofit partner. Same way that the uh, public partner cannot look at the private sector partner as a meal ticket. All right, this is one of the biggest problems of municipal wireless. A lot of communities looked at the private sector partners as people who would come in, build the network for free, provide services for free, give the government all kinds of goodies, and somewhere, some way, maybe one day make a buck. This is not a committed relationship. Some of you know, you have to have commitment in a relationship. I could go somewhere with that one, but I'll just, I'll just let that one go for the moment. All right. We need to be inclusive rather than exclusive, right? We're not hurrying to the altar. I need to have uh, you know, one public partnership so I can get this grant money so I can move forward. In broadband, particularly locally, there are a bunch of partners who have various roles to play. 
and we have to really be aware of that. And as we make policy on the Washington side, you know, the policy has to look at these partnerships. You cannot say, okay, we are going to foster public-private partnerships, and we're going to set up this grant, and we set the rules to where they totally favor a private sector-only broadband effort. That was probably one of the most common complaints about the stimulus rules was that they were really heavily in people's minds oriented toward the private sector, right? So at a national level, we have this same issue. We have to understand that if we want to foster partnerships, you got to understand how those partners are going to need to work together in order to get to the promised land and have the right kind of help from you to get there. Choose well and choose wisely is basically, you know, summing it all up. No your partner's needs. I think I saw that in Cosmos once, but sorry, sorry, I, I regress. Oh, you know, I'm looking at Cosmos. Um, <clears throat> now this one's a tough one, right? This one talks about creativity. Imagine Congress having a discussion about creativity. Oh boy, the thought, <laughs> the thought is rather amusing, isn't it? However, I feel like one of our problems in broadband is that we have a very um, restricted view of the kinds of things that we can do to move forward. We have, as one person described that I met with yesterday, you know, we are always fighting the last battle. We are dealing with rules and legislation that was written in 1984, if not years before that. And this is not, you know, just so we are clear, this is not about bashing uh, net neutrality, which for the record I favor, right? But it is, we carry on these discussions and these arguments in very last century terms. We, you know, one of my complaints about marketing among uh, s internet service providers is that it is very 1992. Right? We are all about the individual user, and we're all about churn, and we're all about trying to you know, solve very old problems, and the market has moved beyond that. Skype and Facebook and YouTube and a whole slew of other technologies have changed the playing field. They have changed the market. And I read articles, and I, and I listen to these discussions a lot of times, and I feel that at a national level, we're not there. And subsequently, you cannot be creative in a 21st century way if all of your thinking is weighted down with 19th century concepts. At a local level, right, one of the hardest things to do for people who haven't had broadband and who have lived um, without a lot of like basic resources, you know, you talk about bringing uh, technology to underserved communities. And sometimes the solutions that a local community might come up with are fine for people who have understood technology and have used it for five or six years. However, if someone comes online, a community comes online that has had zero uh, interaction with the internet, they have kids who are reading at grade levels years behind what they should be, right? Your solution is going to have trouble if you cannot think in some creative way that says, okay, they're not coming from the same place we're coming from. I can't just give them a laptop and a uh, internet account and say, have a nice day, right? One of the uh, interesting sort of random stats that came out last year was that iPhones are extremely popular in low-income communities. Right? And everyone's, you know, if I say iPhone, probably the first thing you thought about was, you know, all the hip ads that we see from Apple for the iPhone. And you assume that, you know, it's the upwardly mobile, and it's the professionals, and it's all the hip, trendy people from the burbs that are buying iPhones. However, for a number of reasons, which we, I could go into at a later point, um, that's not the reality in low-income communities. So the iPhone actually represents a creative solution, a very different solution to the adoption issue because it addresses needs in a very different way for that community than it does for other communities. So 
I've made a big point out of this because I think it's very important once we get past the mechanics of numbers and we get past the mechanics of the need assessment and so forth to realize that at a certain point we've got to bring creativity to the mix. We've got to be able to look at different communities and say what they need is very different than what we have experience with. Facebook has changed the dynamic of how people interact. So we need a new kind of creativity for how we set up and structure these, these plans. We need creativity in business models. You know, everyone is very, um, let me just give it, I guess, an example, because I've gone on this, on this path for a while, right? I talk about who's going to pay for the network, okay? Businesses are a group that's going, that, that's a good market, if you will, to, to underwrite a lot of the network. But you can't sell to businesses with the same mindset that I see in the ads and the, the, the customer service and the structure of how the telcos sell services and products, right? They have a very consumer-oriented focus. It's all about the discount. It's all about the spiff. It's all about, you know, the pizzazz and so forth. And they don't understand how to sell to a business in a solution type of way. Right? And I can say this with experience because long before I got into broadband marketing and the public sector you know, and, and how I worked there, I worked on the private sector side. And I worked with businesses who talked about there's a disconnect in how people market to us. Right? There needs to be a new creative way that we approach the business market. Right? And within all of your constituents, you're going to have this issue. We need creativity in the business model itself. Right? I think we have a very structured, some people have a very structured view. We want to build this network. We want to sell services for $39.95, and, um, and we're going to have a very consumer-focused approach. We're going to have a very old 19th, 20th century telecom approach to how we do this network. Right? Um, so if I look at Ontario, New York, and, and, and a number of other places, you know, their, Ontario County, sorry, their approach is, um, to their business model, is we, the county, are going to pay for the building of the infrastructure. The creative aspect, well, the creative thinking, not so much that they're doing something new and outrageous, but the creative thinking is that we have the ability, as a government, to get bonds, get funding, financing, whatever, but we can have a 25-year payback, and no one's going to have a stroke because we don't have we don't have stockholders. So they said, okay, great, we will build the infrastructure and put it on a 25-year ROI plan, which means it doesn't have to make as much money every year, every month, especially initially, that it would if a telco built the same network because the telco's got what stockholders quarterly reports, everybody's on their back about the profit now. So they changed the whole thinking. Well, let's just do the network in such a way that we don't have those pressures. Then what we do is we make the network totally open. Anyone who wants to be a service provider can come on to the network and sell services. So now the service providers who used to think about, you know, I don't want to invest in this community because I've got to build it and then I've got to service it, no longer has to build it. All they have to do is come in with good creative services and boom, they can start selling from day one. Right? This changes their price structure, this changes how they market, it changes how they think. Right? As opposed to the old school thinking, which is, oh my God, the community wants to build a network, they shouldn't be in the broadband business, we have to fight them and we have to sue them and we have to do uh, all kinds of magic in the state house to have really restrictive laws written. Right? very old school, unimaginative, totally regressive approach because there's no creative thinking happening in that discussion. Right? We need more of the Ontarios. We need more of the Wilson, uh, North Carolina, where they built a network that is superior to any other option that, that's available. And they have 12 years. They're on a 12-year payback mode. It's a very different way of thinking. And everything about broadband really should be looked at from a, why do we want to do it this way? Everyone else has done it this way for the last 15 decades. We need to think differently. We need to think creatively. We need to push different envelopes, right? Got to have someone to unleash the creativity. 
you know, we have to think about the community as a full partner. And this is a radical concept. If you don't think it's a radical concept, look at all those 17, 18 states that have restrictive muni network rules. Look at how, uh, you know, the battle gets, battle lines get drawn in, in Congress and, and all over the place here relative to, you know, communities should not have an active role, right? It's very old world. It's very regressive. Communities think the same way sometimes. Oh, we can't do that. We cannot get in that business. We can't operate this way. We can't carry debt. We can't, um, you know, structure a, a, a public-private partnership, right? The creative thinking is, effect, is, is affected at the local level as well, right? You have to, under, have to have people understand it's a different world. It's like someone else I was talking to earlier today that talked about, um, you know, you're trying to explain to someone that you want to build this network because you want to change uh, how healthcare is delivered. Well, how can we change how healthcare is delivered? Because the nearest hospital is like five counties over. You're not hearing what I'm saying. We're, 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 it's a new space. There's this new technology that will put the hospital in your backyard, you know, metaphorically speaking, right? But you have this, this, this conventional way of thinking that plagues us at the local level. And you have to move people past all of that. Communities United for Broadband, for those who can see the little graphic down there at the bottom, is this little project because I'm not overworked nearly enough and I needed to do something yet more on top of my schedule. So with, a, with some folks I know, we created this organization, um, Communities United for Broadband, to tap into the creativity of communities. Right? The concept is simple. You could do this at home. You know, it's basically find a bunch of people who are excited about broadband, give them a place where uh, they can get links to information, they can get links to resources, and they can collaborate with each other. So they can turn this, uh, this creativity loose. Right? That's what Google did. Right? Everyone talks about what's Google trying to do? What's their business model? Bah, 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 bah. What Google did was basically start a creative discussion that the stimulus and $7 billion didn't do. $7 billion did a lot, make no mistake. Right? But it didn't really you know, get those creative juices flowing. It was a government program with government processes and regulations and all the politics that went with it. Right? You know, the, there wasn't a whole lot of creativity except for maybe to figure out how you can get like a public-private partnership in 30 days, right? But, but you bring people together and you turn them loose in a way that they can work and, and, and push each other's creativity. We need more of that at the local level. And from a policy perspective, we need policies and programs that push that button and enable that kind of creativity to run rampant. God, Zooks. All right, my Canadian example. Know why we're here. Ultimately, the know why we're here question relates to the ROI issue, right? Um, return on investment. I spend X amount of dollars, I get a return. Now, this is difficult for, for, for government folks and nonprofits to relate to sometimes. But in order for the project to be successful. You get all this whole needs assessment and so forth done on the front end. But somewhere in the process you have to establish benchmarks and guideposts and ultimately accountability for an ROI at the end of this. Right? We don't want to put a bunch of money and time into a process and then, and then a year later we need more money, we need more time, we need more technology. There, there has to be some benchmark that says, okay, we're going to achieve this by this point in time, and then we're going to achieve this in this point three months down from that. And it has to be, every discussion has to start with, what's our return? Now, it doesn't have to be just about numbers, right? It should be to a certain extent. If I'm going, to, you know, if we have a thousand businesses in town, we want to get 30% of them onto our broadband network so that in a year or two, they are 20% more profitable, all right? Whether you get there or not to the penny, okay, accountants in the house will want to get to the penny, make no mistake. But what, what you do is everyone's clear and focused on where we're going, and then you're able to measure how you're gonna get there. Also, also important, 
is that the ROI drives then the thinking and it drives the creativity and it gives people some clear point besides, oh, we're going to have broadband, right? I appreciate the fact that you're going to have broadband, right? But that's not the end point. The same way access is not the end point. Getting 10,000 people online is nice as a general starting benchmark. Great. We built a network we got 10,000 people on. What are we trying to achieve? Right? So this ROI question in hard numbers is, is important, right? Because if the network costs you $100,000 a month to operate, somewhere you got to get $100,000. When you do that, you, you know, you broke even. If you do 100000 and a few bucks on the side, great. You now have a profit. If you do $90,000, we have some issues and we're going to have to adjust and move forward. Right? I was amused earlier in um, one of my, um, uh, we'll, we'll say, right-leaning critics of my first book says, you know, well, Mr. Settles here advocates that communities think like a business. And that's the problem. They can't think like a business. Oh, spare me. Right? But it is true that if you don't think like a business and if you don't think about the return on the investment, bad things will happen. I just believe that the communities, governments are fully capable of thinking and operating in that mindset. Right? And so you want to measure hard numbers, but you also want to measure you know, the warm and fuzzy. Right? We have um, you know, 20,000 underprivileged people online this month. Maybe that doesn't represent any revenue because those are, you know, gratis accounts, but that is the public good side of the network. And all of these things that are the public good, the warm and fuzzy, the intangible benefit, you need to have some benchmarks for those as well. Because when you get in a city council meeting or a county commissioner meeting and people want to know where is our money, what did we buy, right? We got, you know, X number of new business startups. We watched the number of kids graduating go from 40% to 60%, right? It's not a dollar and cents issue, but more kids have an education now because of this technology. You have got to have benchmarks to measure the success, or not, of the network. I cannot emphasize that enough. And then finally, to sort of wrap this whole thing together, the key with the, with the ROI aspect of it is, you know, you keep everybody in point. What are we working towards? If you get 10 people in a room and they come up with 20 answers to the question, what are we here for? What is this network here for? You have a problem. You're not going to get to the promised land if that's the, the kind of response you get. People need to be on point. ROIs, benchmarks, helps people get there. So I think I've pontificated enough. I think it's time to move on to our panelists who will actually be people who do all this stuff so they can actually tell you whether or not you know, what, I'm, what I'm saying is true. So who's our moderator? Here's Greg. Okay, so for this uh, next part of the discussion, uh, we have uh, three additional experts uh, who, as Craig has said, has, have been doing implementing this in the real world and um, are either heading up networks or overseeing them. Uh, and we'll have a discussion regarding the benefits, the challenges, the how-to, the best practices, as well as policies to support the development of municipal and community broadband networks. So we'll begin with some moderated questions, and then at the end, we'll open up to the audience I know that we have quite a few watching online, so if you're watching online, you can use the uh, Twitter hashtag BeyondBTOP if you want to ask a question. And I also wanted to quickly thank Magnet who uh, for hosting the stream on their website uh, and uh, for helping us get some additional viewers online. So my name is uh, Benjamin Lennett, and I'm a policy analyst here with the Open Technology Initiative. Uh, let me give a very quick introduction to our other panelists before we start. 
Uh, first up, we have uh, Brian Sivak. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> uh, he's a Chief Technology Officer for the District of Columbia. Uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to find many federal policymakers in DC that are actually aware that the district has its own reliable and robust uh, municipal fiber network. DC Net, which extends 310 miles across the district, connecting more than 200 buildings and serving approximately 76 district agencies. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Joanne Hovis, who is president-elect of the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, uh, the national association that represents the communication needs and interests of local governments and those who advise local governments. She is also president of Columbia Telecommunications Corporation, which provides communications, engineering, consultant services for public sector and nonprofit clients nationwide. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, and then lastly, we have Gary Carter, who is an analyst with the Information Systems Department of the City of Santa Monica. Uh, Santa Monica has a very successful municipal fiber network that serves the city, colleges, schools, and other community anchor institutions. Uh, they also recently have expanded the network to provide support for local businesses who can lease access to dark fiber on the network. Welcome, Gary. So um, I think this should be a very interesting discussion. So I wanted to sort of start off with, while it's all fresh in everyone's mind, uh, with the rest of the panel to have a sort of a quick reaction uh, to Craig's uh, presentation, talk about maybe ways that it aligns with your experiences or, or unique uh, experience you've had on your own with uh, working through that process. So sure. I'll start with Brian. Good thing I was paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I. Um, uh, I mean, a, a lot of it, I think, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Um, a, a lot of what I think um, you said um, was, you know, pretty much motherhood and apple pie, right? Um, you know, the, the piece about the ROI argument really, um, I think, is, is a critical point. I, I mean, if we want to do anything as uh, the District of Columbia in terms of rolling out a municipal uh, a municipal network, and I'll leave the technology out of it for a second. We have to figure out how um, we're going to pay for that, both now and operationally. Um, now there is, um, you know, as a government, there is something to be said for providing a service that doesn't necessarily have a financial payback associated with it immediately. Um, I can make the argument that it is uh, part of the government's responsibility to invest in a social infrastructure, of which, uh, you know, the internet might be one of those things. So, you know, while we might not have to have a dollar for dollar payback, or even a, a dollar, you know, made on every dollar invested payback. Um, I do think we do. We need to think about the the investment and how we get some uh, some of that back over time. So there, there's a lot more to comment on, but I want to make sure everybody else has <laughs> has a chance. But that was the one part that that really kind of struck me. Um, probably not a coincidence, but that was exactly the issue that I zeroed in on. Also, and I have my notes here, so I apologize for having my computer open in front of you. Um, I um, Let me go even a little bit further than Brian and suggest that um, I liked a lot of what Craig had to say, but my personal feeling is that framing what we do in community and municipal broadband as having to pay for itself and having to operate as a business and pay back like a business misses the point of community and municipal broadband from the standpoint of why we're really doing it. Craig was exactly right about the needs needing to drive the technology and the needs being about, that, that is at the center of what we're doing. But it's exactly those needs that suggest that the ROI is something less tangible, not warm and fuzzy, it's actually pretty concrete, but less tangible in some ways than the dollars that you're going to see on financial statements. Businesses operate by what the numbers are on the financial statements. Governments operate by what the benefit is off those financial statements. Government is all about trying to create what some people would call externalities. There, externality is the wrong term, I would say, because when we're talking about broadband, those so-called so externalities are actually the primary reason why government or communities would invest in broadband and work on broadband. That's the driver. That's why it matters. And given that, I strongly agree and encourage that we quantify those benefits, that we try to understand them in concrete and quantifiable ways. But given all of that, it's those benefits that should speak to us about what the investment should be and the justification for the project. 
an ROI on the financial statements is a secondary thing. And most governments don't ask what the direct payback of other kinds of government initiatives are. They don't look at the dollars that will flow back to the government from that initiative. They look at the quantifiable benefits of what the government is doing. Roads, highways, bridges, tunnels, social programs, and so on. And I would suggest that it's those off the balance sheet benefits that are really what's important here. And if we quantify it that way, we do not need to concede an argument that is frequently made by those who oppose community broadband, which is that the networks are not successful unless they cash flow and make profit. That's not the right metric. That's a private sector metric. Public sector metric is all the benefits off the financial statements. And I guess I'll reinforce what uh, both Joanne and Brian <laughs> talked about being the financial because it is such a critical piece. Um, I don't, I, I don't believe business or gov governments need to view it from a business standpoint. I think they really just need to be a be a government, and uh, if they want to be around in the, the global economy in the future, they're going to need to invest in their infrastructure. Um, you know, as far as the financials go as well, you can definitely. Uh, find cost savings from reducing your telecom lines and outdated circuits to justify your construction of the of the network. So Santa Monica, for example, was able to um, realize uh, a payback within a few years, actually, just because we had so many outdated lease circuits. Um, by by reviewing advanced technology, we were actually able to uh, pay back the the construction of the network quite uh, in, a, in a few years. Um, so, you know, I don't think that uh, the payback will be an issue if you're already at that capacity where you have a, a large telecom budget. Um, so let's sort of talk about kind of the needs part of it. Um, and, you know, Brian and, and Gary uh, maybe can fill in some specifics, but how are sort of your networks kind of meeting sort of the needs of the local community in a way that, you know, the private sector or, you know, your local telephone or, or cable company is not able to do and what are sort of some really tangible benefits that you know not related to an ROI particularly but something that it can be measurable uh, with respect to your networks sure so <clears throat> um, just a, a little bit of background on what DCnet is and what it does um, currently DCnet only provides um, uh, services to uh, DC government institutions so um, the, the numbers you have are, are slightly outdated. We, okay. we have 338 miles of fiber underneath the city, 118 miles of aerial fiber. We connect over 300 uh, uh, individual buildings in the District of Columbia, including D.C. government buildings, police stations, fire stations, um, uh, parks and rec centers, public libraries, schools, you know, et cetera. Um, there, there's a huge amount of benefit to this, obviously, um, and I think everybody in this room is probably well aware of what, what those benefits are. Um, I think the real question is, uh, where can we go and what can we do from, from here? Um, you know, I would love to see, um, and, and I don't know what this looks like, I don't know how it, how it works, I don't know if it's a public-private partnership or if it's something that we do, um, I would love to see at some point in the near future every home and business in the district have low-cost, high-speed connectivity. Um, the, I think the government has incentive to do so. I don't know that the private sector has incentive to do so. Um, one, of, one of the statistics that I quote quite frequently is um, in the northwest section of, of the district, um, as you guys probably know, it's a relatively well-off area, the adoption of high-speed broadband is over uh, 95%. So pretty much everybody has bought uh, a connection from somebody. Um, in the uh, areas of town <clears throat> east and south of the river, Adoption is around 36.4 percent, um, which is, I mean, really, you know, in definitional terms, that that is the digital divide right there. Um, the thing is, you can get a connection if you want one anywhere in the city. Comcast cable goes everywhere. Uh, DSL goes everywhere. Um, yet people have chosen not to to purchase these things. So I, you know, when I look at um, uh, organizations like Verizon who've signed a uh, franchise agreement with the city to roll out Fios, I don't understand what their incentive is to roll Fios into the southeast part of the city when people aren't even buying the connections that cost a lot less. 
So, you know, I think the government does have some responsibility here, and I think we do have some uh, motivation. Um, I, I have a somewhat evangelical belief that, um, uh, you know, if we do provide these types of, of connections, along with the training and along with the equipment, um, if we can figure out how to do those things, we will fundamentally change the fabric of society in D.C., um, much, you know, to, to everybody's benefit, not just the people that, that were not connected before. So it's, you know, um, there's, a, there's a long road ahead here. Um, you know, I think we've just started down the path. We've built over the last um, really nine or ten years now an incredibly advanced um, uh, fiber network, and one, one of the most advanced that I've ever seen, and we've started to provide um, some pretty amazing services on top of that. So, you know, the question is, where does that go? And, and this is something that we're really looking at right now and trying to figure out. Gary? Um, well, Santa Monica is a 8.3 square mile city. Uh, we're located right on the Pacific Ocean, and we're home to global high-tech health and entertainment companies. Google is there, uh, HBO, uh, Asset Media. We have a lot of post-production companies, things like that. Um, and we really, our, our business climate really demands uh, a high broadband uh, capacity. So we, we're, we're seeing with uh, Santa Monica CityNet services, we're seeing that um, a lot of our businesses are able to uh, reduce the bottlenecks that they were, a lot of the videos and movies uh, at some point in time go to Santa Monica, whether it's filmed elsewhere or not. And they were shipping hard drives via FedEx and other, other ant antiquated methods, obviously. Um, for the same cost that now they're able to lease dark fiber and now have a 10 gigabit you know, connection. Um, so we're definitely seeing a lot of additional business interest in Santa Monica, which you know all the regional cities, uh, of course, want to stay attractive as well. So we're talking to some of them and we're connecting, trying to help them build their networks out as well. Um, just from an economic development standpoint, I think it's a great program, great service to offer, and um, I definitely encourage it. Uh, Joanne, do you have just sort of some, with the communities you've worked with, some, you know, discussion of how, you know, these networks have met needs that, you know, would not have been met otherwise, or unique to, you know, institutional networks or so forth? Um, I. Absent community and municipal fiber, I think there would be very few schools and libraries in the United States that would be getting a symmetrical gigabit or even 100 megabits in capacity. Um, even in the, the population centers where infrastructure is available, um, most schools and libraries that are not served by government fiber are getting T1s and try to imagine a school of 300 or 600 or 1,000 or 3,000 children served with 1.54 megabits per second um, in, a, in a modern environment in 2010 and the kinds of needs they have. I would, there are many things that community networks, many needs they are meeting, but I, I would say the one that is always front and center in my mind is that they are delivering capacity to schools and libraries the places where huge numbers of Americans are served, particularly libraries in this environment, or job search centers, is really what libraries have become. Um, they are delivering that kind of capacity in a way that communities can afford. Uh, and that's really not happening otherwise because the pricing on lease T1s is in most cases significantly higher than a, a gigabit purchased from DCNet, for example, which is 600 times the capacity of a T1. And um, unless we see something really substantial change in the build-out and the pricing practices of the industry, it is community fiber that's delivering capacity to schools and libraries. Great. Craig, do you want to add anything? Well, probably maybe a clarification, which is, <clears throat> We have defined broadband as a critical asset and a very important one and, and very critical to the public good, which I don't deny. And in discussions about profitability in a traditional business sense, um, 
the public good, if you're a government entity, trumps profitability in the sense of, you know, we don't want people making typical private sector profits from this. If the network breaks even, if it loses some amount of money in the, in the interest of the better good, that's fine. However, the, the, the political and economic reality that you have to guard against is we're like where we are today. I mean, how many schools are getting budget cuts? yet they are vital to our communities. How many public safety departments are getting budget cuts even though they're critical to our communities? So you, you want to look at this from the perspective of you don't want it to be one of those things that gets cut when there's no money. Right? You want to you you fulfill your obligation for the public good, but you're going to be hard pressed to do that if like a lot, for example, in California, a lot of money is being cut from parks. That means there's no service, there's days when you can't get to them and so forth. If you had that same thing happen to a network that you build, where you have to cut the support staff and you have to cut uh, the hours that the network can operate, or you can't upgrade it when there's new technology, this is going to be a problem. So you have to pay attention to the dollars and cents in the balance of, you know, we, we don't want to make, like I said, we don't want to make a profit, but we don't want to lose our shirt, nor do we want the network to fall into disrepair in a really bad uh, economic time or a bad political climate. I mean, let's face it, when, 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 when there are changes in the political scene, certain populations and certain infrastructure is more vulnerable than when other folks are in power. I mean, it's just a political reality. So you have to prepare for that in your planning. And, and you're right about the intangibles can be measured. You know, they're not necessarily warm and fuzzy, but like I was saying before, you know, if I can show 20,000 people are adopt, have adopted the technology, if I can show that um, you know, we've increased the graduation rates by 20 or 30 percent, that's a tangible benefit. It's not a financial benefit, but it's enough maybe in a, in, a, in, a, in a questionable budgetary cycle to say we need to keep paying for the network. So, um, so let's, if we could then kind of go through sort of some of the different models, because I think this discussion on ROI and you know, how you measure benefits depends a lot on whether you're building a full fiber of the home network or you're building an institutional network like Santa Monica and DC. So if we could just sort of kind of go through the differences a little bit. Um, in terms of, you know, because I think there's a lot of confusion sometimes on what we're talking about with a municipal fiber network or community broadband network. Okay. Or anyone? Um, so we have a range of different models in the fiber environment, um, starting with, um, starting frankly in the late 80s and the early 90s with local governments that built institutional networks known as INETs that were partnerships with their cable companies and were um, parts of the how the cable company paid the local government and the local community for use of public property, which is the public rights of way. The cable company would build some fiber um, and give it to the local government to use for government purposes and non-commercial purposes only as part of it. So that's, that is one way that hundreds of communities got fiber, um, lit it themselves, operated themselves very successfully and have for 10 or 15 years in some cases and, and deliver very high bandwidth services to schools, libraries, uh, public health facilities, government buildings, and very importantly, public safety and here in the DC area. That's a huge factor. The Homeland Security Networks here, the local regional ones are all based on that kind of fiber. Um, that in that way, local governments were actually, frankly, a decade or more ahead of the federal government in thinking about high capacity fiber and big bandwidth. Uh, the second category would be government fiber networks that are have no connection to the cable company but that were built out by the local government, sometimes through their public works process, sometimes through um, uh, their traffic process, like they put in fiber if they were needed to get some kind of a connection to traffic signals um, or to backhaul uh, video surveillance or traffic cameras. And those networks similarly tend to connect institutions, not the public, but um, deliver very high bandwidth to institutional users. And then the third category is networks that are public facing that deliver services to the homes and businesses of 
residents. And in that category, in the government context, we have 57 functioning municipal networks in the United States, um, many of them in small towns and rural areas and some of the most conservative parts of the United States, actually, because outside Washington, this is not a partisan issue. And, um, and these are, in most cases, very successful networks that have been worked on very hard. But there are probably about half a million people in the United States who are served by municipal fiber to their homes or business, uh, which is a pretty small number, but a significant one nonetheless. And that's where there's a lot of excitement and um, potentially a huge breakthrough in the next few years. And just one final thought, um, the, these different categories, I think the, the importance of the networks that serve institutions have been newly recognized through the national broadband planning process and very importantly, through the BTOP grant program from NTIA under the Recovery Act, because BTOP really recognizes that if you serve these big institutions first, that fiber can get big capacity into places like libraries where so many Americans will go for their connectivity if they can't get it or afford it otherwise. And then that fiber can serve as a platform for other providers private sector, public sector, nonprofit to come in and bridge the last mile. So this fiber serves multiple purposes. And that's also a model that local government has pioneered over the past 10 years and that is now being recognized through the BTOP program in Washington. Uh, Brian, Gary, Craig, any, any comments? Oh yeah, I mean, I can, um, you know, briefly, the uh, the model that DCNet employed was actually one that Joanne mentioned second. Um, it, we basically built it ourselves. Um, it was actually a direct response to um, September 11th. Um, uh, I, I was not in DC at the time, but I can only imagine, uh, based on the stories I've heard, that all of the telecommunications networks were um, pretty jammed up, uh, including public safety. And it, um, you know, that was sort of the justification for the investment that we made as a as a city into building the initial uh, phase of the network. Um, but it has proven to be very successful, and. Um, you know, as Gary said, um, you know, the the interesting thing I think about it is that the build out really did pay for itself in terms of the money that we were spending previously to uh, the commercial carriers uh, prior to build out of the network. Um, and we still do have some leased lines um, from AT&T and Verizon coming into various uh, district buildings. But, um, you know, the amount of money that we are saving as a government overall uh, is, is pretty significant. Um, I think the really interesting and, and create you were talking about creativity a little bit. Um, I think the creativity really comes in in trying to figure out what the model is for expanding this to uh, the businesses and the individuals that live in the city. Uh, and there are any number of models that I've heard so far, each of which is potentially more creative and clever than the next. It's just a question of, you know, sort of what is the right one? How does it sit politically with the leadership uh, at the time? Um, you know, can we uh, pony up our share of it and find the money for that somewhere? Uh, and these are all questions that we need to, to look at and answer now. I think now is exactly the right time to do so. Um, and Gary, Santa Monica sort of has an interesting model in how you sort of started you know, very much with an institutional network, but you've expanded to serve your businesses. So, you know, can you Yeah, can you I'll elaborate a little further on that. Um, we, we built out our INET, uh, actually our, we, our Cat5 uh, operator at the time, built it for us. And from that, we were able to save about 500 500,000 a year. It, the cost of our backbone to 40, I think 43 public safety buildings at that time, um, it allowed us to save 500,000. The, the cost was five, 530, so within about two years, we, uh, we realized the savings were able to disconnect those least outdated circuits, those T1 lines. Um, and from there, we were actually approached by uh, businesses, um, the, uh, local businesses, like I I named a few of the high-tech entertainment companies um, that asked if they could do the same thing. So they adopted our model, or not it's not our model, but essentially look at the price of the construction, look at the cost that you'll save over a few years and either do it or not. Um, so as they build out their laterals, then the, then the businesses located you know, a few blocks down were able to do the same and it kind of just expanded that way. So the businesses paid for um, the a lot of the laterals to our network, and it didn't need to be paid by public funds. At the same time, uh, Joanne talked about how 
we can use, you can really, um, as a city, you have synergies uh, within your departments, public works, transportation. So when the streets are open for those reasons, you can just lay, the, the cost to lay a uh, conduit and fiber very minimal compared to the, uh, the actual construction cost to dig up the streets and so forth. Which brings another point, um, as a government, you don't want, uh, for traffic uh, reasons, you want to make sure that uh, your streets are getting torn up just for one or two connections to service ISP. So by laying uh, an open access type of network where you can let ISPs connect to it, uh, you don't need multiple ISPs digging up your streets pretty much. So as far as the model, I think, I'm sure there's a lot of models out there, but um, if you're in a business climate that really demands high bandwidth, um, it, the, the demand will really drive the, the, uh, the network expansion for you. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's a, an idea that is really the, the heart behind our sort of broadband superhighway is to why don't we just integrate, you know, laying, putting this infrastructure, which is really infrastructure nowadays. Uh, you're just moving bits uh, instead of cars and trucks and goods. Um, and so why not do it in a very sustained uh, manner over time? And so. Can, can uh, I make one comment to that? Yeah. There's one really interesting point there that kind of struck me. So if you've got, uh, sorry to interrupt, but if you've got, um, businesses coming to you and saying, you know, we're spending X per month on our, you know, big fat connection because we need lots of bandwidth. Uh, and we think we can save money if you, you know, if we pay the initial capital construction cost of a, of a, a you know, a strand of fiber coming to our, our building and then a much lower monthly cost for that service. I mean, that's, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, what would be really cool would be to um, create some kind of tool a calculator almost, that anybody in a city or anybody, I don't know if you have this or not, but anybody in, like say the district, could type in their address, we could calculate the distance that the fiber had to run from our backbone to their house or business, and then give them a cost per month. And they could make the decision right then and there whether or not they wanted to fund the construction of that piece of fiber. I mean, that's, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, we actually, uh, we had a paper so this and is related. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, it's, 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 I've never it's heard not a completely new concept. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, uh, Homes with Tails, uh, which mm -hmm. was sort of building on this idea that we, you know, either re individual residences or you could develop some kind of condo approach yeah. to build the fiber yourselves to a neighborhood and then be just connect with either a public subsidized one or a private provider or whatever. Um, so why hasn't that been done? Uh, it's been done in Canada. Why not here? Um, I mean, I what, what's, certain... what's the holdup? What's, what what's the pushback? Well, I mean, we have a very powerful <laughs> <laughs> uh, telecom and uh, cable industry in this country that, uh, you know, likes their business. So, mm -hmm. you know, I... I what I, we need is leadership. <laughs> 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 um, I, 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 I do think it, it has to... I, I think there's still a sort of a mindset that needs to be set. It means needs to be changed within policymakers of, again, viewing this as a basic infrastructure like we would sewers or mm -hmm. water. And I think if we can get to that point and move beyond services, because everything seems to be about services, and, and you know, then there's a role then, I think, for sort of these new you know, public and individual pay, you know, paying into the system to, to build the actual infrastructure. But Can I comment on what Brian said? Because um, it's a really intriguing idea. And I think the pushback on something like that would be the industry saying, as they always do, unfair competition and I, but imagine a true competition for high bandwidth services yeah. the fact is though that it's not unfair competition in that there isn't a market at the moment because really big companies I'll talk about San Francisco which I know better than the LA area but Lucasfilm can afford any connection it wants to its facilities and pays for those connections and can have built whatever it wants but a small startup in the same industry, which is a Hollywood-focused digital media industry, something San Francisco has tried to develop, can't under any circumstances afford to pay for fiber to be built to their facility and can't afford to pay for the higher bandwidth connections that the industry is willing to sell it. Most times the industry won't sell dark fiber at all. There's no market for that if a small business could even afford it. And the higher bandwidth capacity for a small digital media company could be $30,000 a month. And for even a successful small company, that's completely out of the question. So what you have is what we were talking about here is the situation of companies 
sending hard drives back and forth by FedEx. How long are our cities going to be competitive with cities in Asia and Canada and Europe that have fiber to their small businesses in that environment? But that's why what you're talking about is so important, is making this kind of facility available to small businesses because they probably can't get it anywhere else. It's not just that you would be less affordable, yeah. it's that you would be affordable, period, and nobody else is. Yeah, I mean, it'd be like asking, you know, calling up Verizon and saying, hey, build me Fios and, you know, drop some fiber to my house. And the chances, you know, chances of them saying yes are very slim. Right. And, you know, uh, Craig talked earlier about, you know, open access networks. And, and this doesn't have to be like a mutually exclusive exercise. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, if you have the infrastructure there, you're running an open access network, there can be any number right. of independent service providers that are, you know, private, um, you know, profit motivated that are providing services over it. You're just ba providing the basic infrastructure. So um, why don't we, we haven't talked much about wireless. Um, and um, wireless gets conflated a lot with municipal networks as well. And um, I was on a call the, yesterday and apparently in, in North Carolina, uh, there's been an argument among uh, the the telcos have been pushing that uh, cities shouldn't be investing in fiber because wireless will replace it eventually. Um, and so, you know, ha you know, for the panel, sort of evaluate the accuracy of that statement as well as how does wireless sort of fit into a fiber network or in. You know. I can start. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we all have our wireless <laughs> stories, but. Um, I think where it fits in is where Craig talked about just wholly doing the public good. Uh, because of this fiber backbone, Santa Monica has been able to install a uh, 25 Wi-Fi hot zone. So at our promenade, on our beaches, in our parks, um, anyone can come with a mobile device, especially their iPhones now that Craig talked about. They're all over Santa Monica. So um, those types of devices. And, and we have a, a large tourism industry, so a lot of tourists come with their GSM phones and things like that but they can Skype over Wi-Fi and, and the like um, to communicate back home. So they're tremendously popular. We have a Santa Monica College in Santa Monica. A lot of students go to the parks to study. UCLA is nearby, um, and it's free. Um, we're able to do that because you know installing an access point is, is, a, is a minimal cost as long as you have the fiber backbone in place. We're going further now to, um, to put place Wi-Fi uh, throughout our uh, corridors um, on uh, with the tr with the transit uh, project that's going on, so that we have uh, wire Wi-Fi to control some of our uh, bus routes and um, notifications, and we can other folks can use it for their wireless devices. And I, I think wireless is pretty cheap, um, and it it, all, it 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 complements our fiber network. Which now that we're connected to one Wilshire that houses 268 ISPs, I believe. There, there. We're in discussions now where some of the ISPs are looking to, um, to, to, uh, to provide the the, uh, the bandwidth to the Wi-Fi locations to just demonstrate their services um, in some of the parks. So that would actually reduce our budget uh, that we're using to pay for the uh, the IP for those for those locations. Uh, I think it's a good complementary um, service. Although, again. You know, our business industry really demands uh, a fiber solution. Jump in here for a second. One, I want to put context to the statement from North Carolina. The argument was being made as a way to um, justify the legislature's anti-immunity network uh, bill. So basically the statement was uh, fiber is going to be obsolete in a year. I don't know where this particular legislator got his intelligence from, but I mean market intelligence, sorry. And, um, oh boy. But the whole idea was he was using that as a hammer to beat down the um, pro muni government folks because he was saying that fiber is going to be obsolete. And had, the, uh, had wireless been talked about by the different cities that were making the case for broadband, he would have come up with some similar disparaging remark about wireless. So that's the, the context of, the, of that particular item. From a practical standpoint, I'm a firm believer that everyone needs to look at both wired and wireless when they're developing their plans. And in fact, during a lot of the stimulus uh, activity, um, in one of my blogs I wrote that it may be wise to consider using fiber primarily as a backhaul technology, but to consumers 
use technology, use wireless technology with a combination of uh, customer premise equipment and so forth to get people to a threshold where for personal use the broadband is sufficient for say the next year and then looking at how Santa Monica has, has in essence created a business market you um, develop that business market for the fiber so it would go like this you build fiber as a backhaul you put in wireless technology uh, with some super duper repeaters and you deliver maybe three four megs to the home and particularly in rural areas where you've got distance issues and other things to worry about then your business community starts to buy fiber extensions from the back hall to their premises for which they will pay premium rates for that. Don't soak them, but you know, I mean fair premium rates. And that expands your fiber. And as the fiber expands through the community, at a point a year or two down the road, you start expanding uh, the fiber to the home. So in essence, it's a tiered step approach that allows you to meet current broadband need with a clear path to uh, greater broadband speeds down the road. And I think people really need to look at that, um, that type of an option. So wireless is part of the equation. Brian, do you have anything? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I think it's, uh, my perspective is pretty straightforward. I mean, fiber is really the only thing we've got right now that's, that's future proof, right? Um, we've got wireless technologies that'll that'll you know get you, rel you know a good part of the way there these days. But who knows what's going to happen kind of going forward? And we have massive amounts of capacity in the fiber network that we can you know basically inject anywhere that we have fiber running. Um, now you know the outdoor hotspots. Obviously, fiber is going to help get you there, but not provide the connectivity in the outdoor hotspots. So you know the wi wireless is a, a key component there. Um, you're not probably going to run a, a fiber connection to every room in your house uh, or every office in your in your building. So, you know, wireless is a great way to kind of reach all the nooks and crannies there. Um, and, you know, I think uh, as you were saying, uh, you know, there it's it's a good stepping stone also for um, when you have a backbone near um, you know various places that you want to extend connectivity to, but can't drop the fiber in immediately. Right. Um, and I think that that does make a lot of sense. And we're doing a lot of that here in the district. We're actually um, looking at using um, some neighborhood improvement uh, money that's been set aside for infrastructure to actually do exactly that, to take um, uh, fiber connections that we have going into parks and rec centers that are uh, part of um, uh, public housing developments in, here in the city and actually extending wireless connectivity to that entire public housing district just to, you know, kind of prove the point that, um, you know, the, the access along with education uh, programs can actually make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so why don't we move, because uh, I think we're running a little bit over on time, um, to talk about federal policy and, uh, Specifically, you know, what are sort of federal policy ways in which federal policy can assist uh, with the deployment of, of municipal networks? Are there any current federal programs that need to be reformed or improved uh, to spur these types of networks? Are they holding? Are they creating any obstacles uh, to these networks? We'll just go down the line. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, from a federal policy perspective. I think that what needs to be in place are policies and programs that allow the community, whether it's the uh, city level or county level or even at the state level, to define their needs and define their solution and then the government program assists the execution of that. I think, you know, a, a defining, you know, either wireless companies or fiber companies to be the recipient of grants and assume that they will meet all the various needs of local communities is backwards. It's how work is being done, but to be blunt, it's backwards. What you do as a business is you, you go to the end user, they define your needs, you bring in the vendors and you say, these are our needs, now who is going to meet those in the best way for the best investment? And it's plain and simple. And so I feel like all of this money that's being spent in stimulus, all the money that they're talking about in USF reform, is going to have limited impact, though, in those situations where it's going to the private sector to drive the solution versus 
the, the, the local uh, communities. Um, and, and I'll just sort of riff on that for a second. Uh, basically, um, uh, we, we actually have a few applications in this, this new round of BTOP funding. Um, which uh, are actually looking, um, it, it's interesting. Um, they've done due diligence on, on the three applications we currently have in right now. And to be honest, the questions that they asked were uh, really good. Um, the people that they have doing uh, the due diligence on these applications, they're, they're being incredibly thorough and asking actually very intelligent um, and meaningful questions that have caused us to go back and, you know, sort of <clears throat> rejigger the plans that we have a little bit. Um, so, you know, I, I, I like the, the, the things that we have out there right now, um, the applications that we put out thus far to build um, uh, a public ring um, to anchor institutions in various parts of the city based off of the, the backbone that we currently have that we don't have connectivity to right now, um, expanding training programs that we have in libraries, um, and uh, expanding programs that we have at uh, the district's um, schools, uh, University of D.C. and the uh, community college. Um, and, you know, they, they've, um, like I said, they've been doing a good job with this. So um, I think to your point, they haven't really, you know, we, we put in the application in the district, no vendors have, and so that's sort of where the, the consideration lies. I can, t I would totally agree with your point if it had been sort of the other way around, if, if you know, the, the local providers had put in for the stimulus funding to build these networks. Um, so I, I think, you know, that I totally agree with that point. Um, really quickly, number one, I'd like to see the federal government preempt state prohibitions and barriers to municipal and community broadband. Um, number two, I would like to see the Universal Service Fund reformed in a variety of ways, and I will agree with what Sasha said in his introductory remarks that um, there are a whole bunch of things that could happen, but I think primarily the Connect America Fund, which is going to go to build broadband in the most rural, unserved areas, uh, the language of the National Broadband Plan does not suggest that local or state governments or nonprofits would be eligible, um, and that I think is a very big mistake. I'll also add that E-rate, uh, local government networks are not eligible for E-rate funds. Those monies go to subsidize private carriers only, and that's another pretty important change that would add not only um, competition, but also much higher bandwidth networks into the E-rate world. Um, third, and I think this picks up on what Brian said, um, I think BTOP has been a very substantial success, as has BIP, um, the two um, broadband um, programs that came out of the Recovery Act. And as Sasha said earlier, um, BTOP 2 would be a very welcome program, and I, I'll focus on BTOP because it includes adoption and computing centers as well as broadband, and broadband in all kinds of areas, metropolitan as well as rural, but it has stimulated incredible um, partnering, excitement, innovation, and work throughout the country, and I give NTIA a lot of credit for some very good work for funding public projects, nonprofit projects, private sector projects, and some very cre creative and innovative projects. And I should recognize that we have a BTOP awardee sitting right here, um, Mike Smeltzer of Urbana-Champaign Big Broadband, a fiber to the home network that was funded in round one. Um, and just the fact that a public inter-jurisdictional fiber to the home network was funded by the federal government suggests that we're moving in a very good direction. Finally, my last point about what policy changes I'd like to see in Washington is um, I, I think we need a really substantial shift in thinking that for the past 15 years, the industry and many policymakers in Washington have always trotted out local government and state government as the people who are getting in the way of broadband deployment. And if it only it weren't for us and all those annoying things we try to do, like community representation and local input and management of public property and responsible use of the rights of way and all of that, then they'd be out there building a lot of broadband. And that just isn't the reality of the economics of broadband. The private sector will build only when they're going to make money. And if we you remove one of their costs of doing business, it's not going to change their investment patterns and it's not going to do anything else. And we have to look at the reality of where broadband innovation has happened. Local governments have been at the forefront <coughs> of broadband innovation and the two gentlemen on either side of me are perfect examples of that for 10 to 15 years before Washington even discovered that we had a broadband problem. And I think that's a really important recognition that should inform policy.
Well, I, I applaud the uh, the NTIA's efforts uh, in administering the grants and awarding them to different communities. Santa Monica was not one of them, which means that all these other <laughs> cities uh, have no reason but to succeed in their networks uh, as long as the demand is there. Um, I, th I think really what they just need to do is to support uh, municipal networks. And I know we've, you know, not that we're doing any private bashing or any ISP bashing, but um, the the current market it's 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 a lot of factors and in, in uh, reaching out and really talking to the ISPs in our area that wish to enter our market um, I learned about the different costs associated it's not only the service costs you have the construction costs you have your marketing costs you have the costs uh, that, that they may pay the property owner to access the building um, so th there's there's a lot of there's your consultant costs there's there's a lot of these different costs that uh, don't necessarily need to be there. And I think that uh, everyone in a community needs to really shift and change. And if they wish to adopt uh, different models, um, they'll do that. And uh, it takes more than just you know the federal government, the ISPs, or even the local government. It's really, if, if everyone wants this, then, then it'll, it'll, it'll succeed. Great. So I'm going to open it up. Uh, to the audience for questions and James if we have any questions online um, so questions uh, do we have the mic okay uh, yeah Michael Calabrese from uh, New America here um, yeah I just wanted to ask just a little bit more about uh, you know municipal Wi-Fi when you have these INETs because it seems that, in, in fact, I think, I think it was mentioned here that once you have a, a municipal fiber network, you know, it should be, it would seem to be fairly minimum cost to just, you know, put, you know, put antennas up, uh, you know, at the pops, uh, particularly, you know, if, if you have a lot of the institutions. So with 338 miles of fiber and hundreds of uh, public institutions with fiber pops, I mean, what is, um, I don't know if you can tell us something about the cost or the other obstacles. I mean, it just seems like kind of a no-brainer to go out and, and create a, uh, uh, you know, Wi-Fi uh, coverage, particularly in those, in those parts of the community, you know, wards six, seven, mm -hmm. whatever, that don't, that, you know, that have, are having trouble uh, affording, you know, uh, you know basic uh, connectivity. We actually have done that. Uh, I mean, every single uh, building that's connected to DC Net is actually a, a wireless access point on uh, the DC Free Wi-Fi network. Um, so covering all the surrounding residential neighborhoods. Well, I mean, as you know, not as uh, not. I would I would say not significantly far, right? I mean, if we put an access point on the outside of a building, the radius of coverage is what you know, 500 feet or so, right? Um, but the building is covered internally, um, so every you know police station, fire station, library, school, etc., um, and some have external um, access points on them as well. Um, so that is something we are doing, and we're we're also looking at um, lighting up some out outdoor areas in the district where fiber is uh, in close proximity. But it's a good point. <laughs> one um, one add-on to that, it's. Um, if you build a fiber network and then add on wireless, it's still a cost, even though it's less of a cost, right? I mean, it's, it's less expensive to put an access point up than it was to dig and trench and build the fiber. Yet it is still an, a budget issue. Um, the greater concern, actually, is whether you charge that for that service or it's free. Because, if, for example, in Oklahoma City, they built a network for city use. And then the question was, do we provide the service to consumers? Well, the, 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 the gating factor for them was if we charge for this service, we are going to incur uh, customer service and support and upgrade costs and other management costs by having a customer base than if we just gave it away for free. And I think that one of the big issues with municipal Wi-Fi and why a lot of Wi-Fi networks failed initially is there's a... Um, there's the hidden cost, right? People think that once the, the, the infrastructure's up, you're done. But in reality, a lot of the users are consumers. And from a dollar perspective, it is more expensive to support, to market to, to deal with the issues of consumers 
it than it is uh, for businesses, particularly once you start charging. So you have to, I think, as a community, think about really what it is that you want this wireless to do, to be, and, and, and so forth. I'm not saying that's a negative and you shouldn't do it, but it is a cautionary tale that before you do, think clearly about what it is you're trying to do. Right. So, for example, I don't pay separately for my street lights. You know, it's considered a pervasive light, like pervasive connectivity is a, you know, so has a great public benefit when you consider the all-in community, uh, you know, welfare. So, but then even St. Cloud apparently has uh, has stopped uh, that free Wi-Fi as an amenity uh, because of the ongoing operating costs in a tough fiscal environment. So, I don't know if there's any comment on that. On St. Cloud? Well, St. Cloud... Um, that was sort of the issue I brought up earlier, which was for the public good, they built the network. And the network, one of the, um, their rationales for the network was the communities were spending a lot of money and the money was going out of the city, like $4 million a year. So they basically, as a community, saved all that by putting the network in place. However, eventually came the issue of operating it and the fact that at a certain point you have to replace access points or you need to upgrade them based on you know capacity issues and new newer technology that will get you better coverage and so it's a dollar amount it may not be a huge amount and maybe in normal economic times you don't notice it but there comes a certain point where um, that cost you, you just have to address the issue um, and you can like I said you can find ways around it you can find a situation as in St. Cloud with when they got rid of it the community said well we want to continue it well, then that was a community decision. We will continue to incur this cost, even though we don't have the budget for it currently, because it is such a great community good. And then they move forward from that position. So I think that's the issue that you have to deal with. Other communities, you'll get the, 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 the city council, you know, being politicians, will may turn on you and say, well, we don't want to incur that cost anymore. We feel it's bad for whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, it's like in, in, in North Carolina, if, if, if wireless was a topic point by the, the supporters of municipal networks, the legislators trying to kill muni networks would have found 101 reasons why wireless is the pits. And you, you, you have to, you know, it's a reality you have to deal with. Joanne, did you want to add something? I, I guess it really just comes down to what your parameters are. And I think that one of the things that went wrong in the Muni Wi-Fi experiment of the several years toward the middle of this past decade that we went through, one of the many things that went wrong is that we allowed self-interested incumbent carriers to define what success would be. And one of those definitions of success, or the definition of success, was that the network had to pay for itself and justify itself rather than thinking of it like any other government service and an essential government service at that that's built into the, into the tax base. And in parallel to that, I think another one of the mistakes is that there were expectations on the part of local elected officials and decision makers that this was going to be free. And it's not <coughs> going to be free. It's never, ever going to be free. And so you had this combination of a metric of it's got to pay for itself or make money and this enormous disappointment when it turned out that it was going to cost something. Um, and that's where all the focus was instead of where it should have been, which was those quantifiable but ancillary benefits, the, the ones that are not on the balance sheet. And we will hopefully slowly go through a shift in thinking that we increasingly talk about connectivity as a utility, and that will become a universally understood matter and then the the considerations will be completely different okay so we're quite over on time so unless there's a, a dying dying question I think we will uh, we will end the event but uh, please give the panel and, and Craig a, a, a round of applause